let us kick off. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Expert Talks Online. I'm Lisa Copeland, Head of Strategy and Product for North America here at Equal Experts. Tonight, we welcome Dr. Monica Sumra. And before I go into her street credentials, I wanted to share some insider knowledge about Monica and her path to today. For many in our EE network, we are believers in the agile pivot and in our pivot with purpose thinking and framework, she walks the walk, explained by this story. Monica was wrapping up her business degree at University of Toronto with the challenging economics course. And after a midterm, she just didn't feel she did so well. So looking at different avenues, she found an intro to anthropology class that could meet the graduation requirements and fit her busy schedule. Talk about a pivot. That intro to anthropology class was a class that kicked off a journey to today to fuse business and looking at business problems through the lens of anthropology, the study of humans, and now adding technology into that sphere. A small pivot plus a huge dose of bravery. And I might add, she actually received a top grade in that econ class, yet she didn't look back. And now Monica is founder and senior business anthropologist for Bunka Inc an anthropology-based leadership results in organizational culture methodology. As a business anthropologist, Monica is uniquely qualified to investigate the degree to which people are aligned with their culture. And through the lens of anthropology today, we're gonna to explore what does leadership look like in this remote working environment? How do we foster trust and build relationships and maintain cohesion? And how do we make our interactions more meaningful, more human? After Monica's talk, we'll run a Q&A session as time permits. And now a little bit about meeting protocols. You can start adding your questions now using the Zoom Q&A function. We'll be answering the top voted questions. So keep an eye on what questions are being added and vote for those you'd like to see covered. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Monica Sumra. Wow, that was an incredible introduction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, for, for for that, I really, really appreciate that. And before I begin, I wanna thank everybody at Equal Experts for um, having this platform where people can share their knowledge and learn on this platform. So thank, thank you very, very much. I wanna actually, before I, I really dive in to start sharing uh, the anthropological perspective, I want to actually tell you a little bit of, give you a little bit of background on how I, how I got here, how I'm actually talking to you right now um, through this lens um, of the camera. So, Last year, as we all know, we, you know, we've all been kind of thrown into COVID-19 and after speaking to, you know, different people, clients, uh, co-workers, family, a lot of people expressed this, uh, you know, the idea that, you know, the gains that were being experienced early on in the pandemic when people moved from, you know, the um, office environment to a work from home environment where people were motivated and delivering results, that has started to wane probably mid last year. And a lot of people ask me, you know, what, what do we do? What are some of the best practices out there? What can we do to help people through this so that we can have this still produce the results we need to, <clears throat> excuse me, and still be there for the people. So in my uh, research, uh, I looked online, you know, went through various resources, but the one resource that really, really intrigued me and compelled me to think about this more deeply was the uh, remote working playbook uh, on the Equal Experts website. So that really, it was really well written and really got me to start thinking about the human aspect. So an idea popped into my head at the time, okay, we're remote humans, but we don't wanna be remotely human. So how do we build back that connection and improve the quality of that connection? Because one of the things I think a lot of people are finding right now uh, is that even though we have all this technology and all these apps and all these services to help us connect with people um, from far away, there is no substitute really for what we feel when somebody's physically present in front of us. So a lot of people are, are missing that. I know I'm missing that. I'm lucky I have my family at home with me but I'm missing other family members, missing that, that hugging and even my colleagues, you know, shaking their hand or saying hello or giving a fist bump just to see that body language. So it's very hard in this environment to really judge how we're being taken and, and how people are perceiving us. So that's kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, what launched me into this whole um, way of, of trying to understand behaviors. So 
just to, before I begin, I actually always like to set the intent of, of whatever it is that I'm going to talk about or discuss. So today my intent is to share with all of you what I've learned from colleagues, from friends, um, from clients, um, and a little bit sprinkling of, of, of myself in there, um, of what their experience are. And I'm very thankful that they, they felt that they could share all those things with me. So as far as COVID-19 goes, everyone is going through their own journey on this and um, everyone is struggling. I'm in this with everybody else too. But what I'm very, very thankful about is that I have other people that are co-experiencing this with me, including everybody that's online right now listening to this. So thank everybody for, for being on this journey with me. So what I wanna also talk about it very quickly is to just share kind of the uh, what, what this is gonna look like the talk. So very briefly, I'm gonna give you just a very quick introduction to anthropology and then talk about the anthropological lens through which I base pretty much everything that I do in my life. And then how that relates to the practice of uh, leadership in, in, in a remote environment. So without further ado, let's, let's dive right in. So anthropology, uh, many of you might be familiar with it and or taken any courses in it, but it's actually derived from Greek. Uh, anthropos meaning um, humans and ology meaning the study of. So quite literally anthropology is the study of humanity. There are four sub-disciplines. Um, some of you again may have taken courses or have seen stuff about it. So there's archeology, span um, biological or physical um, anthropology, and uh, there's um, linguistic anthropology and sociocultural anthropology. So <clears throat> Lisa said a few uh, minutes ago um, why and how I ended up taking an anthropology course. That was actually very late in my life. So I went back to school at the age of, of 43. I decided to go back and move from business and go back and be a student again. And just really quickly, when I took my first course, Introduction to Sociocultural Anthropology, um, I'm a biosocial anthropologist, but that course really is what kind of changed who I am as a person. I, I walked away after the first class thinking, wow, there's a lot I don't know about people. There's a lot I don't know about the world. There's a lot I don't know about how people, including myself, make meaning of our lives. And I wanted to know more. I wanted to learn more. Why do we, why do, we do the things that we do? So um, for me, the anthropological lens through which I, I look through everything is this lens of holism. So looking at this idea of things in their entirety. And what I'm really, really interested in all the time is you know, the interaction of various aspects of life and how they influence one another. And as a biosocial anthropologist, so again, <clears throat> what I look at is hormones, and uh, behaviors and how they, they're espoused in individuals based on, on different identities, forms of identity. Specifically, uh, you know, my, my, most of my research lately has been focusing on leadership and leadership attributes. So for me, this pandemic, it, it's, it's a perfect, perfect natural experiment to really understand how we as biological beings move through this social world and one, how one impacts the other. So in a nutshell, what I'm always interested in is why people do what they do the way they do what they do. So that's, that's predominantly what shapes everything that we do. And uh, in my company, Bunka, um, myself and my, my co-founder and co-partner, this is the lens and this is the um, foundation through which we look at everything. Bunka actually stands for something. So B is be the leader you would follow U is understand your power to empower others. N is nurture your relationships. And then knowledge is yours to share. And then the A is authenticity is your status quo, which is what we say standing in your truth. So typically, you know, we're boots on the ground. What we do is we, we customize everything that we do in terms of uh, evaluating culture um, uh, to help leadership move to the next level to improve performance. So we've had to do another pivot. Um, Lisa, you were talking about that earlier uh, to really move through this pandemic and move everything that we did boots on the ground to a virtual platform. So we're doing that, but the bulk of the work that, we're, that we do right now is really focused on executive coaching. So that's something that we do, we're doing a lot of. 
uh, right now through the pandemic, something that's, I think, really needed by a lot of people. So after, like, the, in terms of the anthropological lens, I, I kind of want to start talking about that. Let's, let's talk about COVID for a moment. I, I'm not going to get into all the details because all of us, like I said earlier, we're all experiencing COVID in our own way. We're all experiencing what's going on. Um, a lot of people right now are afraid. They're afraid of the future. Um, they're uh, tired. Many of us are just exhausted, exhausted of the information, exhausted of working you know, through a screen, just very, very difficult thinking about the future. But the one thing that I found that's really common across the board is that there's this uncertainty. We are living in a very uncertain environment. We're in the midst of the pandemic. So we're not at the beginning of the pandemic. We're not at the beginning of, you know, early on where we didn't know what was going on, but we're not at the end yet either. We know that there is an end. We know that there is um, light at the end of the tunnel, like people say, and this will be over, but we don't know what that looks like. And we don't know when that's gonna happen. So this is this whole, we're in a transition state from where we were before to where we need to be. So, Anthropologists, we, we call this state of betwixt and between the state of liminality. So it's a liminal state. Um, what, what, how we usually use the concept of liminality in anthropology is to describe rites of passage. So to give you a very quick example, um, let's say um, there's, you graduate from university or college, and then you're in the process of looking for a job um, and trying to establish yourself you know, in your career, in a vocation. Uh, but you're not there yet. So even waiting for your three month probationary period to be over. So the period between graduation and the time you establish, establish yourself in your career, that is uh, what we call a liminal space, uh, lim time of liminality. And the, the thing with being in a liminal space is that it's a very vulnerable period. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a dangerous time, if you will. So you can see that right now that in the current space of liminality that we're in, neither at the beginning of COVID nor at the end of COVID, you know, you see things happen. People say things that they think are okay, but are not okay, or do things that they think are okay and not okay. We make decisions and then later recant them. We learn things about the virus and how to move forward. And then something comes up and then we have to unlearn all that we learned and relearn something else and behave in a different way to get through this. And that's because we're in this push-pull state. We're in this state of transition. And the best way for me to describe that for you is if any of you have gone on a merry-go-round in a park or um, a ride at an amusement park that spins, when you get off something that's spinning you, um, there are a few moments uh, or even minutes or seconds that you're unstable. You know, you can't, you can't see clearly, you know, you're on the ground, you know, you can see things, you know, very, very blurry, you know, there's something there, but, but you're not, you're not stable. That's kind of what liminality is. And the reason we're vulnerable in that state, if somebody was to like poke you and push you while you're in that state, you'd probably fall over. But if you found your feet and, you know, you can see things, even though they might be far away, you'll know what's coming. So this is why the state of liminality that we're in right now, it's, it's a dangerous state. It's, it's difficult, it's challenging, and this is why you know, there's a, this back and forth. So that's liminality and, and that's what it is. Now within this larger liminal state, we have a huge liminal state and that's our home. So the homes are now offices, they're now universities, they're now schools, they're now caregiving facilities, they're everything. There is no blurred line, there's no home and office, it's, it, everything is in one place. So for myself, I'll give you an example. I have five people in my home who all work virtually. So we've got five different organizations operating within this house. Um, and some people have, you know, kids going to school. So many things are happening. So in this, lim in, in this subliminal state, so not subliminal, but subliminal, um, people are sharing resources, right? Um, I just told everybody, hey guys, I'm gonna be on a, a call. Be quiet. So we're, we're trying to create the space and trying to respect each other's spaces. So even in that environment, there's push and pull and, and all that stuff happening. So we got to be cognizant of that. So why, why am I talking? What does that have to do? What does liminality have to do with leadership? 
Well, for me, it has a lot to do with it. I want to draw your attention to the to the graphic that I have on the screen here. Before I've seen this picture so many times, I've seen people use this image as well. And just until recently, you know, it meant something different to me. But if you take a really close look, the person who's trying to pull the individual towards them to take them forward is taking them with them. They're pulling them, taking them to to where they need to go. They may not have been there themselves, but they're taking them with them as opposed to being behind them as a leader and pushing them, um, which may result in the person falling you know, in between there, that, that gap in between, or getting caught on the ledge on the other side, which makes it very, very difficult, right? So for me, the essence of leadership is pulling, pulling people and taking them with you to where you need to go and where humanity needs to go um, and where decisions need to go. So that's, that's really kind of the reason why I'm talking about this today. It is precisely during these times of liminality where we are in this in-between state that leaders, it's, it's a call for leaders um, to come in and, and take action. So this is the time we look to the people that uh, lead us to take us to wherever we need to go, even if they don't know where we're, where we're headed. So today, my, my, what I've done is, is consolidated a whole bunch of uh, conversations and information to give you a little bit of maybe some things to think about to, to improve yourself as a leader, uh, but also to help help people on your team as well. So I'm, I'm going to share this with you. We, I call them the, uh, the R's of uh, remote, bunk, uh, remote uh, leadership and uh, the bunk R's of remote leadership. So let me, let me share the first one with you. So reconnect. When I say reconnect with yourself and your team and others, things have changed in COVID. So what was meaningful to somebody before COVID may not be meaningful to them anymore, right? So think about yourself, you know, what, what's motivating you right now? And uh, how are you making meaning of, of, of this time, right? Um, who are you as a person? For example, are you, are you co-parenting right now? Are you living alone right now? Are you caregiving for somebody? Do you have people in your home that are, that are also working? Um, are you motivated by, by money still or are you motivated by position? Has that changed? So it's really important to reconnect with people and yourself to kind of reevaluate you know, who we are as individuals. So when you're doing your one-on-ones with your team, it, it, I, I'd suggest that you kind of ask some questions or put some stuff in there where you can kind of get to the heart of trying to reconnect with them and find out what's changed in their life and, and uh, how to move forward with that. So that's R number one. Let's move to R number two. So re resource. Um, last week, I, I had a phone call with, uh, with a client of mine who expressed to me that he was very, very upset about a recent uh, cultural evaluation that came out. It was uh, earlier this year, just a couple of weeks ago, and that the results that came back were that, you know, the culture was rated as poor by some people. And, and he was really surprised, really surprised because they did everything in their power to, you know, ensure that people were safe, you know, worked from home. Some people worked in the office. Um, you know, they put plexiglass everywhere and even at Christmas time, they sent a whole bunch of gifts to all everybody in the organization to show them that, you know, they really appreciate the work that they've done. So I asked him, I said, well, how did the people feel, you know, that worked in the office versus the people that worked from home and, and what was kind of the makeup of that? And he mentioned to me that some people had to come to, to, the, to the office because there were fundamental functions that needed to be done on site. And other people didn't have a laptop, so they had to work on site. So then <clears throat> when I said, you know, well, how do, how do they feel about it? He said, he gave me a whole bunch of answers. And then I said, well, do you know for sure? And, you know, when you don't know for sure, rather than assuming, I always say the best thing to do is ask. So suffice to say, after he had a conversation uh, with, with those individuals, you know, he found out that a lot of people felt that they were not valued by the company, that their safety and their health was not valued because they were forced to come into work um, while others were sent home and only managers' lives were valued because they were allowed to work from home and these individuals weren't. So when, when this all came out, you know, they decided as a team to make a decision on, you know, getting some more laptops for some people, giving them the resources they need, both on-site and off-site, and 
just change their approach and communication. So that was a great opportunity for them to, to move in and start fixing the situation. So resourcing your people with whatever they need to, to get the work done that needs to get done in a safe, in a safe manner. So the next are, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about this. So reassessing, reassessing your leadership skills, trust and psychological safety, really, really important. Being honest when you do this reassessment. So in terms of your leadership skills, are you using some other leadership skills right now uh, that you weren't using before the pandemic that you may wanna brush up on? That's something you may wanna consider looking into. And trust, what does trust look like right now uh, in your group and on your team? Do you trust people differently? Do you trust some people more than others? Do people trust you? Um, and are you using even trust correctly um, uh, in, in, in your company and in, with your team? And I'll give you a very quick example. I was uh, on a call like this, a virtual call with a couple of people just a few days ago. And in the beginning of the conversation, I heard one of, one of the uh, individuals tell the other, you know what, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I can trust people that have little children at home um, to get the job done. It's, I, don't, I don't know if I trust that situation because how could they possibly focus? And unfortunately, he, he didn't realize that the other person that, that he was talking to um, has little children at home and is delivering. So his body language changed and there was a lot of defensive defensiveness going on. And the question came out of his mouth, you know, um, are you saying that people who have children uh, working from home can't deliver and can't do their job and you don't trust people who are in that situation? And of course that was not the case. After we had a huge conversation about it and kind of whittled down, we realized that Lee, he didn't mean trust, he meant confidence but it, it got perceived in, in, in that way and um, led to some ill feelings. But the good thing is when you're in a situation like that, even if you make a mistake, you can fix it. So we ended up you know, having a positive discussion at the end of it, but be careful when you're using certain words and saying certain things on how people may perceive what you're saying. And in terms of psychological safety, does everybody on your team, every single person on your team feel comfortable to bring up issues, um, good or bad? Are they comfortable to even, um, you know, put, give their two cents in terms of what, uh, you know, what they wanna suggest as something to do going forward? And you can kind of check, check the temperature for that with the way people are communicating with one another. So look at the way the chats are going and the conversations are taking place, see what words are being used um, and, and kind of, you know, the combination of words and the tone. That'll tell you a lot about, you know, psychological safety. So those are some of the things that, that, that you can look at, um, you know, when you're trying to reassess that. So let's, let's go to the next R. This one's so important, recover. Mm. So recover from, I put fatigues here because there's so many fatigues. There's screen fatigue, there's red eye fatigue, there's talking fatigue. There's listening fatigue, everything under the sun. So some of you might, you know, like to meditate or um, go for a run or exercise or, or cook, um, whatever you want to do. Make sure your team and your team members are doing that as well. They're making the time to recover. Recovery is what helps us adapt. So if you know, we're doing all, putting all this effort into what we need to do and we just keep putting the effort and don't give us the time to recover. There's no adaptation taking place. And we need to be able to have these adaptations to get through, through this crisis. So a very quick example is uh, on Saturday, actually, all of us decided at home, all my family members, we said, you know, we're not gonna look at the screen and watch a movie together. We're going to um, come, um, we're going to meet in the family room with a glass of wine and uh, bring a reading. We're going to read something to each of us, something that's meaningful, and just take 15 minutes. And, and we did that. And it was, it was incredible because even though we all know each other very, very well, just to see the time and effort that the other person took to share something that was bothering them or they wanted to talk about in something they wanted to read, whether it was a book an article, it was a really good experience. That's something you may wanna do with your teams, you know, start a meeting off and have somebody read something. So that's, that's another idea for recovering. And then recognize, I can't stress this enough. I was speaking to a friend of mine uh, day before yesterday and um, she was 
ecstatic on the phone, such a good mood. Every, every word out of her mouth was like happy. And I asked her, said, you know, what's going on? You're, you're in a real good mood today. And she said to me, said, you know what? I was on a meeting uh, just a couple of days ago and there were 75 people on this call in, on, in a video meeting. And my boss's boss gave a shout out to me, recognized me and said, hey, you know, so-and-so, I want to just say, you know, the, the, delivered that project on time. That was amazing the way you handled that situation. And then everybody clapped online. And you know what? I, it made me feel incredible. And then she said, I had a team meeting afterwards and that meeting went so well. So the power of recognition goes beyond just that individual. Everybody else sees it and then it, it fuels that individual to enduring this time of COVID Anything that we can get to take our minds off what's going on and help us move to where we need to get to is great. So recognition, recognize your people, uh, any people, even a colleague, even a friend, those are really good things to do. That's a really good thing to do. And then the final R that I wanna talk about, which is really, really important. So I wanna just spend a little bit of time on this. Reflect. So reflection to me is this inner conversation with yourself. So when you get the opportunity to reflect, it's good to think about what are the things you did that went well and what are the things that you did that didn't go well? Were there opportunities for you to do something um, and you didn't do them? And then ask you know, yourself why you didn't do them. Was there something you said that uh, was inappropriate or wrong or you don't know how the other person took it? Um, or did you leave something unsaid? So for example, if, if somebody doesn't deliver on something, ask yourself, you know, was I really clear in, in my expectation and in my, in my conversations? Did I, did I really, was I, was I uh, very forthright and forthcoming and what needed to be done in a nice way, in a good way? And then being not just observant, but consciously observant. And by that, I mean, observing how other people are behaving and speaking and reacting to you um, and to each other and internalizing that a little bit. How are you reacting to that? Uh, are you reacting to that in a positive way? Are you reacting that, to that in a negative way? How are you fulfilling um, and helping yourself get through that, whatever that is? And I'll give you um, a very quick example. Um, have you ever been in a situation where you hear something, somebody says something that completely is not aligned with the way you think. It is not aligned with your worldview, not aligned with your beliefs, not something that you really entertain at all. You totally disagree with. And rather than listening to the rest of the conversation, you, you spiral down and say, I can't believe this person's saying this. This is just ridiculous. And you go down and down and down and down this negative, negative spiral. A way for you to, to, to see that if that's a positive conversation or not is ask yourself this question. If I took everything that I'm feeling and discussing with myself internally and I put it in a picture frame and I hung it on my wall, would I like that painting? Would I like that? And if somebody else walked by and looked at it, would they like it? Would they think it's good? And if the answer is no, then you got to revisit it right? And, and take a look, a hard look on the inside. That's the voice that you have to live with the rest of your life. So only you can hear it. So it's important to make sure that the inner voice is lifting you and supporting you and giving you what you need, right? To, to, to go through it. And through this pandemic, it's even more important. That leads to this idea of assuming. We, I talked about it earlier that a lot of the time we're listening to uh, reply, not listening to understand. And there's, that's a very different, different way of, of, of thinking about it. Listening is a whole bunch of things, which is a completely new talk. I can talk about that for two hours, but when we're listening, we don't just want to talk about, hear about the words we're hearing. We want to talk about the tone. We want to listen for uh, body language. We want to listen for, um, the types of words that people are using and how they're reacting to what we're saying and how we're reacting to what they're saying. And I'll, the last piece of advice with this from me is, if you're gonna assume, rather than assuming, ask, right? But you've gotta understand that we all assume. This is something we all do, even I do this. But it's a practice that I've learned to do less and less every day. As an anthropologist, 
um, I have to. Um, it's I've got to be able to put aside any uh, preconceived notions and biases so that I can be in service to whoever, whoever I'm listening to, whoever I'm studying, um, so that I can get the perspective from, from them and not my perspective. And this way, you know, I'm able to add more things to my own perspective, which is which is a really cool thing to do. So, so it's hard to do. It's not easy to do, but you do a little bit at a time. It's practice. It's simply practice. And the last thing I want to talk about with reflection is because it's so difficult sometimes for us to do what we need to do. My best advice that I can give you is to get a coach. Getting a coach is a phenomenal thing you can do. Your coach should be there for you to push you just enough to guide you, but to be that sounding board. So all those things that, you know, you don't want to necessarily say outside, but you just want to be open and honest, you can do that with, with a coach. So invest in yourself, invest in getting that, uh, whoever that person may be. Very recently, I started, um, I started running. I couldn't even run for five minutes without going out of breath. And I'm proud to say I can now run for 45 minutes. Uh, nonstop, you know, at, at a decent speed. So that's a big achievement for me, but it took me three months to get to that point, 12 weeks. But I did it because I had a virtual coach. And this person, you know, changed the what I thought about running, changed the way I understood, even though I know everything that I'm telling you, I, I know how to do all these things when it comes to myself. It's always good to hear somebody else tell you and teach you and guide you. So even for me, that this was great. Uh, I listened, I learned, I pushed, I pulled, did whatever I needed to do to get where I needed to get to. So a coach, getting a coach, that's one of the best things and best gifts you can give yourself. Um, and we do a lot of that. And there's a lot of people out there that are great coaches. So just, just to revisit, um, these are kind of the, these, this is what we talked about today, the six R's for today. Reconnect, resource, reassess, recover, recognize, and reflect. Now, this is also in a liminal state because we're still going through this uh, pandemic and we might come up with some more R's tomorrow. You might have some of your own um, that we, we can add to the mix, but this is kind of a, a brief overview. Um, and my, my goal today, I just wanted to just reiterate that just like today, you know, we're in the state of betwixt and between uh, in the state of liminality, so so are we about what works and what doesn't work when it comes to leadership um, in, in a remote world. So things are going to be changing and things are, are going to be moving and grooving. What what I've shared with you today is a work in progress and it's, it's going to move and groove as well. I wanted to offer you some insight uh, that can help, you know, build an organizational culture that's going to thrive in uncertainty, be it COVID-19, or any other, next, the next disruptor that might be around the corner. So I hope I've been able to, to do that uh, with you today. Um, some of the stuff I have shared with you today, some might be new to you, some uh, might reaffirm what you already know, and some, of, and some or maybe all of it, you'll say, ah, you know, it's not my cup of tea. Regardless of where you stand, you've learned something about yourself today. So with that, I would like to say thank you for your time and thank you for allowing me to share, share some of uh, my thoughts and some of uh, what I know and um, over and out from Toronto, Canada. <laughs> what else can I say? Thank you, Monica. And on the running coach, I expect to hear last uh, next year that you ran a marathon with your pedigree and <laughs> how you start small and then do big things. <laughs> I'm gonna try, I can promise you that. So let's move on to the question portion. Um, going in the order of top rated, we have one from Lindsay, one of our own here at Equal Experts, and curious about what led you to EE Remote Working Playbook. Did it come up via internet search or did someone recommend it to you? Talk a little bit about that. Absolutely, uh, great question. Um, it came up quite honestly as, um, as a search. So. Um, and I also had heard about Equal Experts through, through you know, a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine who, who is with Equal Experts, but I wasn't even really looking at the playbook. I just knew about the company, but then I was going through the website and I thought, wow, this is really cool. Let me, let me read up on it. So that's how I came across it, really. It was really part of my research. Excellent. We had a couple questions received before the talk and here's one, how animalistic or basic really are human beings when faced with a crisis? 
Wow, that's a um, <laughs> that's a loaded question. Um, if we think about, for me, the models that, that 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 I've used in the past to inform a lot of my work is a non-human primate model, right? So I look, mm -hmm. I try to understand the so because non-human primates are, are very social social animals and social beings are very similar to, to humans. So I think this idea of animalism, if you will, I mean, I probably need more information to answer the question, but I really think it depends on context. I really depends, it depends on uh, where it's happening, who it's happening to. So it's, it's a difficult question to say unequivocally um, that humans have animalistic tendencies. I'm sure they do, but it depends really on the situation uh, when it comes to crisis. And the way we respond to crises really depends on our own uh, mental models and our own um, worldview, if you will. So we see different people respond in different ways, and we and some people view this as animalistic, and others people others may not even view it as that. They may think it's that's just normal behavior. So I think we have we have to define that really um, more clearly. But really, again, I think it's all based on context and all based on people's own uh, worldviews. Hopefully that answers the question. Awesome. And do we really only have like three, the fight, flight, or freeze? Or are you uncovering new um, responses that we humans have? We have lots of responses. Okay, lots of responses. <laughs> and, and I think, I think that uh, so the way I am is I, I am not in favor of labeling anything. I, I feel mm -hmm. that whatever we know today is going to change tomorrow. So enjoy it, put it in a box for today, but then put it on a shelf. Uh, we've got to be open. What's so beautiful about our world and people, which is what happened to me when I started uh, taking anthropology, is that um, everything is okay. <laughs> everything is viable and everything is right. So, so it's, 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 it's a great place. It's a great way to start thinking about things. So to answer your question, yeah. Lisa, we've got a lot more, we have a lot of feelings and I don't even know what they all are yet, but I'm going to find okay. out. Keep trying to find out. Well, give me the scoop too. <laughs> For sure. Okay. From Genevieve, we have, how do we remain authentic yet vulnerable at the time? Sometimes people expect leaders to have a stiff upper lip. And what you're talking about is, is uh, you know, a question I often get when I'm when I'm coaching, and uh, it's a very good question. And if you go to the A in what we talk about in Banka, which is authenticity is your status quo, I think there is a degree of conformance I, that where you have to conform to a certain cultural expectation. Um, I think that that's where leadership comes in. So as leaders, if you don't think that that is the right approach, then you've got to be that person that kind of, kind of comes forward and uh, tries to change the culture in a different way. So I'll give you a very quick way to think about this. If, if it, let's say it's a stiff upper lip and that's the expectation. If it was me, I'd want to find out, well, why is it that people think that this is why what we need to do is perhaps mm -hmm. step up or lip. And what does that mean? What is that telling, telling me? Is it because they want us to be quiet or to, to say what we need to say? So do a little more research yourself and get some more data and figure out, okay, well, why are people doing this? In what context do people behave this way? And then when you kind of put it all together and step back and say, okay, I get now why this has become part of this culture. When you know why something's become um, a valued belief and a practice, it's much more easier to change that, right? It's much more easier to go forward without being coming across as brash because you have to be careful with that too. But I'm always a firm believer that, you know, you've got to be able to, to voice uh, your concern. You've got to be able to say what you need to say. And it also depends on how widespread that is in the environment. I, I can guarantee you, if you feel this way, somebody else feels that way too. So it's always good to find out who else, you know, through, through asking questions and observing all the things that I talked about in my presentation to, to see who you can latch on with to uh, maybe have a conversation about it. So hopefully that, that helps. Yes. 
And from Darren, how do you keep a positive inner voice during a very difficult time for all? So I, I'm going to I'm going to speak very truthfully. Um, I have my moments. It's it's not it's not easy, but it's possible, and it requires practice. The one thing that always keeps me positive inside is I always feel as if the person that's saying what they need to say or whatever's going around around me is is exposed. It's not inside me. Um, I often get the from my, from my colleagues and friends, they always say to me, Monica, if you're happy, everybody's happy. When you're not happy, the whole world knows it and, and we can't function, like we don't know what to do. So as a leader, I've kind of said to myself that it's not about me. So it's, it's about what I express to everyone else. And if I don't take care of myself internally, I no good to anybody else out there. So the impetus for me to have that positive attitude within myself, despite everything that's going on, is that I know that I have to remain in this very positive um, form so that I can help others remain positive. So that's how I do it. Yeah. It's hard. There's definitely, there's a lot of jockeying going on for these top rated questions. They're changing every second, but let me get it in before. Uh... <laughs> changes. We have the remote working seems to highlight more polarities and, and gaps in the organizational culture. Mm -hmm. What are your top three tips for leaders for nurturing diversity, inclusion, and belonging when working remotely? Good question. Um, I think first and foremost, learn. Um, learn about people. Um, when there's when there's diversity, it's not. We often say diversity is more um, surface, right? But really, it's diversity of thought. Because if we don't have differences and we have diversity, we we don't have innovation or creativity. So, I, I think it's important to to get to know. If you don't know something about a particular culture or a particular um, area, go and learn about it. Get educated about it mm -hmm. and ask ask the right questions. That's that's the first thing I would do. The second thing I, I, I would I would really work on as a tip is listening skills. Really, really important. And I brought this up in the talk. And again, and again, listening is not just listening to the words. So we we talk about in bunk of three levels of listening, and I'm sure you've heard this in other places too. And that first level of listening is the internal listening. So how are you responding when you're hearing people say different things that you may not know about? You know, what's what are you responding, which I which I alluded to earlier. The second is body language, um, observing people's body language. And you can do that in a virtual environment if, you, if you've got a call like this, for example, happening. That's why I think it's really important to have people um, on camera so you can actually see what they're doing. It's hard when you're talking, like right now I'm looking at the camera and talking to you, but I, I'd like to see, I'm looking down now at Lisa just to see that body language. So that's the second thing I would do, really brush up on my skills, on my listening skills. And then, Another, another way to think about it is to embrace this diversity across, across the culture is to actually ask people themselves how they want to be treated. Ask people themselves, um, you know, what works for them and what doesn't work for them. What makes them comfortable and what makes them uncomfortable. I think having open conversation about it in a delicate professional way is, is another really good way to kind of make that culture um, more and more accepting. Um, hopefully that's off the top of my head. It's probably more beautiful, that, beautiful. That answers them. Oh, you're doing great. No time for a break. There's lots of questions. Yeah. So this is okay. great. <laughs> no time for a break. That is exactly it. Relax. Right? What is the recovery? No. From Stephen, we have, what should we keep in mind when approaching difficult conversations and providing feedback when working remotely in comparison to in-person over a coffee, say? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a really, really good question. When you're, when you're doing it in person, face-to-face, -face, you, can, you can read a lot of nonverbal cues. Online, it's, it's, it's really tough. Like it, it's really tough when you're face-to-face when -face on yeah. a screen. So again, I think really looking at the body language is really, really important when you're having a difficult conversation. But at the same time, 
go prepared into that conversation. So I always say when there's a difficult conversation, especially in this type of environment, ask yourself, what is the outcome that I want from this conversation? And not from necessarily a um, activity perspective, like I want them to improve X, Y, and Z, but do you want that individual to still trust you after that conversation? Yeah. Do you want to maintain trust? Do you want them uh, to um, understand uh, what the expectation is? Whatever that is, that you create a guiding principle for yourself um, that that'll guide your decision making and what you're going to say through this through the conversation. It's it's more important in a, in this type of environment in a remote environment because. A lot of the time we take our cues from those nonverbal cues when we're having a conversation with a person, right? So we'll say, okay, I'll back off. It looks like they're, they're getting a little bit agitated with this. I, I shouldn't be giving them that feedback or, um, you know, or, or they could, they could just, you could, you know, they could just not want to listen to you and walk, walk out the door, actually walk out the door. Mm -hmm. That's less likely, right? When you're doing it in this type of environment. So setting the intent of what you want to achieve when you're giving that feedback is essential, really, really important. And that'll guide you through the conversation rather than taking your guidance from those other nonverbal cues. Is it useful to give the intent verbally to the person about what your, your intent is for the conversation or just keep it more intrinsic and internal? I, th I think it all depends. So there's two types of intent. So the one is your personal intent and the one is your intent um, almost like an agenda, right? That you're sharing with it. And I'm always a fan of that. Um, yeah. It's very good right up front to kind of set the tone of, of, of what you want to say. Um, I don't know if you noticed from my presentation, but I'm a very um, image person. So I don't like a lot of words. I think pictures say, have a, say a thousand words. So it's that kind of, kind of vibe that I like to give up rather than make it very, very rigid, right? That's just me personally. Um, but I think you should have an internal intent. You're obviously not going to tell the person, hey, you know what, my intent in this conversation is that you still trust me after I say this to you, you know, like, hey, because I don't know. You don't want to do that. What you do yeah. want to do is say that to yourself and use that as your guiding principle, right, to, to guide your conversation. And so when you see that, oh, um, based on what this person's saying or the way they're responding to me, it looks like my original intent of trust that's starting to like go in the other direction, then redirect yourself, redirect okay. yourself to get to that point, right? Now, the thing is, it may not work. Um, it may not be successful, but the good thing is you can go back and do it again. All right, got it. All right, a question from Helen. How do you encourage people to stop responding negatively because it's a habit and to think more positively? Wow. So the short answer to that is, people have to do it themselves, right? But our job isn't to necessarily stop or start someone, but is to actually motivate them. The most powerful thing you can do to get people to stop talking negatively is to ask more questions. That's the best thing you can do. So rather than saying, hey, you know what? You're really negative. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. You could say, you know what? Based on what you're telling me, it's, it sounds like you're not really happy today. Tell me what's going on. What's going on? Is everything okay? And start getting them to talk about the conversation. Sometimes people are negative because they actually are feeling negative. So it's not necessarily just a habit. They actually feel that way. Others are that's just the way they talk. But when you, the per, I always say the, the person who controls the conversation is the person who asks the questions. So you've got to ask the questions. Sometimes you need to ask an open-ended question. Sometimes a closed-ended. But again, rather than telling them that they're negative or saying you need to stop being negative, you say, you know what, you, it looks like you're, you're not feeling the, your best today. You're not, you're not, you know, coming across with a real positive vibe. Is everything okay? Closed ended. They'll either say yes or no. Oh, yeah, everything's okay. Okay, well, then, you know, tell me why, why, why are you feeling this way? Ask mm -hmm. another question. So that, that's how I would start doing that rather than hitting it directly head on. Beautiful. And from Lindsay, we have the reflection content was excellent. Thank you. Do you have any reflection guides that we can use as reference, please? Um, I don't. I, I, I teach it, but uh, maybe I'll put something together. So it's Lindsay who asked the question. 
Mm -hmm. That's a big question and it's going to give me food for thought to work on something. So uh, maybe you'll see something pretty soon. So thanks, thanks for asking for that. And then we have a question received before the talk. What is the one thing that we have gained as humans from this pandemic? There are so many things that we've gained. Um, but if I had to pick one, I would probably say that we can really, really um, appreciate one another through this. Now I know, I know it's not always the case. We don't always see that. But the one thing, one thing that I've gained is, is appreciation. Appreciation for the things that I had taken for granted. I think a lot of us are saying, you know, we took those things for granted, whether it's our parents, whether it's going out, whether it's meeting our friends, whether it's going to see a movie, uh, going for coffee, going to the, the store, whatever it is. Um, I think the, the biggest thing that we've gained is that we've learned to appreciate. We've learned uh, not to take things for granted. Most people, there's something that somebody has realized today that, um, man, I miss that, right? I appreciate yeah. that. So I, th I think that's a huge thing for humanity, more generally speaking, that we're learning this art of appreciation. And I, I hope that it carries on past this pandemic. Agreed. And from James, have you any thoughts on managing internal group dynamics in a multifunctional team where some are frontline medical staff and some are administrative and support in a remote world under COVID conditions? Oh, that's, um, that's, a, that's, that's a very, very good question. And these, mm -hmm. these are all great questions. And if I had time to mull over it, I'd probably come up with a really cool answer. But off the top of my head, um, I think really understanding, again, I think it goes back to who, who are we now through this pandemic and what motivates us. And I think when you've got those different dynamics and you're trying to manage those teams remotely, it's, it's, I think, really, really for leadership, whoever's, whoever is facilitating that meeting or guiding that meeting really needs to be prepared. So need to understand what's really motivating this group, what's really motivating this group, how are they making meaning of what they're doing right now, and then have that conversation so that you're not blindsided and you're able mm -hmm. to, to navigate that conversation the way you need to navigate it. The other really important thing is, again, it goes back to this idea of intent. I think at the beginning of a meeting like that is to really talk about intent and, and tell the group, look, this is, this is where I would like to take this conversation and this meeting, and this is where I see us going. How does everybody feel about that? Are, are we all good with that? Tell me, tell me what you feel. Give people an opportunity to chime in, to help you shape to shape the course of that discussion. And then once you have that in place, ha have the discussion that you need to have. But really it's, it's this idea about empathy and this, uh, this is about authenticity and yeah. putting yourself in the other person's shoes to, to understand their perspective before you have that discussion. So, and it's difficult because even within those groups of administrative staff and frontline workers, there are a lot of differing perspectives, right? There, there's some that are very oppositional. So as a leader, I think that the responsibility should always be to be listening in that conversation, to be to ensure that whatever your intent is, intent is and whatever you want to achieve at the end of that meeting, that is your guiding principle and you move towards that, whether it's asking questions um, or facilitating a conversation through that. But at the same time, cutting yourself some slack. Um, leaders are people. We, there is a lot of pressure on leaders to really deliver and push. And we must. Um, but if you don't take care of yourself first and find out you know, what your limitations are and where you can grow, it's gonna be difficult for you. So arm yourself with that. You know, relax before that, get ready, be prepared, right? Don't be prepared with a rehearsed outcome, but be prepared to, to stay, stay on track to whatever your, um, you know, your intent is for that discussion. So hopefully that helps. 
And from Katie, we have, do you have a view on the ideal balance between homeworking and office-based work, specifically for knowledge workers, programmers, consultants? There are clearly benefits to both at the individual level and also for businesses. So I guess, again, one of the things, one of the R's that I took out because I had too many R's <laughs> yes. was rebalance. And so, so now you're asking me the question about rebalance and um, there, is, there is something to be said. That what, what, what's difficult right now is because the home has become the space within which we work and with it, within which we ideate, within, within which we meet people, right? This is, this is a space. The home part of it's almost taking a second seat, right? So it's not as important. You know, you run down and cook when you need to. So it's, it's like we sacrifice that part of our life. So I think from all the programmers and people that I've been talking to, especially in the tech space, they're working more, more than they ever did before. So part of it is, you creating that balance in your schedule. Um, people have back to back to back to back to back meetings. When are you going to eat? When are you going to? Mm -hmm. When are you going to uh, go to the bathroom? When are you going to have a coffee? When are you going to do any of those things? So, as leaders, I think leaders need to be cognizant of this. And let's say you're one of those programmers and you're stuck in a situation where you have back to back to back to back things going on. The environment should be such that you can say to whoever it is, hey, I know you've, you've, you've got this meeting on my schedule here, but I need 10 minutes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in 10 minutes late because I need to grab a bite uh, or I need to do what I need to do. So I think part of the balance, we own part of that ourselves as well. And we need to bring those issues up. And it goes back to this idea of psychological safety, right? So the, to answer the question how important it is, it's, it's very important to balance that. You know how many hours there are in a day. Judge, judge by how tired you are, right? But you have to give yourself this opportunity to recover. Recovering is key. So if you look at your calendar, there's no recovery there, build it in, build it in. Do what you need to do to, to make sure that you have that in between. Well, thank you. We do have some remaining questions, but we are out of time. Thank you, Monica. You really <laughs> um, broke the bank on all the questions, a really engaging conversation. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for their questions and everyone else in the audience. We will be sending out the video, um, the recording that we have, as well as we can answer the remaining, um, Monica, you and I can work and we can answer the remaining Absolutely. questions and add that um, to the distribution list. A Absolutely. special thanks to you, Monica, for opening up your heart and your time with us. We really appreciate it. There is in the chat, we will be doing this for, um, our friends here back in the US and Australia in two hours. So feel free to sign up and come join us then. And we also invite you to join our next expert talk online on January 27th. We'll, we'll be talking about web forums, the build versus buy debate with UX forums founder, Martin Gladish and Werner Smith. So sign up and we look forward to seeing you on January 27th. Have a great evening, have a great afternoon for those of us in the US and other other places and thank you very much. Thank you.